On August 6, 1945, a single nuclear bomb destroyed the city of Hiroshima. Imagine the explosive force of that bomb, combined with the second nuclear bomb that destroyed Nagasaki three days later, and all the weapons used in the six years of World War II, the deadliest war in human history. The total explosive force of all of these weapons is represented by this single blast. In comparison, this is the combined explosive capacity of the global nuclear arsenal in 2020. Actually, that's not all. There is no protection against nuclear explosions, either deliberate or accidental. We remain vulnerable to them and these weapons are being built in our name. Shouldn't we ask ourselves why? The 71st anniversary, uh, I guess the first element that needs to be repeated is that what we see when we look at pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is this devastation, essentially the message from this, which is there is no protection against nuclear weapons explosions, either deliberate or accidental. That remains true. The size of the arsenals, their uh, destructive capacity, all of this has massively uh, changed, but the vulnerability remains. So really the key questions, both in material terms, in political terms, and in terms of what is the gap between what we think we know and what we actually know about the nuclear world should be, I would argue, framed in vulnerability terms. At the material level, uh, essentially the vulnerability, the primary vulnerability is that uh, once uh, a ballistic missile has been launched, there is no longer any possibility to intercept it and the attempts at protecting the population, either civil defense or uh, ballistic missile defense have proved uh, massively unsatisfactory. Therefore, the state, uh, as we classically think of it, in terms of a protective entity, uh, is obsolete. And essentially, John Hertz's 1959 book on the issue just sets the point very clearly. That, that's for material vulnerability. Then the epistemic dimension of it is the gap between what we know about the nuclear world uh, and what we think we know about the nuclear world. Uh, and then this is where we're going to, I guess, pivot to the question of luck, because most of the policy discourse is framed in terms of control and neglects the limits of control, which I call uh, as a shortcut luck. The main two reasons which I would like your audience to uh, think about uh, are first a gap between experience and analysis. Uh, what I mean by that is that key uh, policymakers, both in the US, uh, in Russia, and the former Soviet Union, either diplomats, uh, military officers, many of them, and there's a list of them in the Washington Post article, uh, speak to the role of luck even though saying that is not to their credit. It's actually diminishing their agency. So they have no interest in making claims of that kind. So on the one hand, you have multiple generations of policymakers acknowledging that luck played a role in avoiding catastrophic nuclear outcomes. Then on the other hand, we have the analytical community, let's call it, who is uh, massively uncomfortable with it, um, either entirely overlooks it or pays tribute to it, but then proceeds uh, to a series of inconsistencies to either reduce it to manageable risk or to essentially disregard it at the moment of shifting to um, uh, the policy recommendations. And those, those inconsistencies I've documented in a piece uh, in the European Journal of International Security. I'm, I'm mentioning that one just because it's a European journal and your audience may otherwise not be aware of it. I need to start by giving you a proper definition. So let's define luck 
as the opposite of control. And then I'll be able to outline three uh, modes of lucky cases, and then I'll give you uh, examples. So essentially control practices aim to prevent accidental nuclear explosions, and they do so through three secondary goals, compliant personnel, working technology, and adequate information gathering and process. So lucky cases can be defined as instances in which a desired nuclear outcome has been achieved in one of the following three ways, which are literally the flip side of everything I've just said. Either it's independent from control practices, or it's thanks to the failure of a control practice, or it's in spite of a failure of a control practice. So the last mode of luck is the only good news, right? Because that's a mode in which a failure happened, uh, but uh, the system overall remained robust. The bad news are the first two modes of luck. Um, the first mode being when the element that saved us from nuclear disaster is independent from control practice. And the second one is when a failure of a control practice saved us. So I'm gonna give you an example of each. Um, the first example is the 1980 Grand Forks fire, uh, which is a clear case of a fortunate outcome independent of control practices. On that night of mid-September 1980, uh, the engine number five of a B-52 on the Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota caught fire. And in spite of the intervention of firefighters, kept burning for more than three hours. Arguably, two steps of the emergency checklist had been performed in the wrong order, which is a problem of personal compliance, but the bit of the case that I'm talking about now is not that. It's once the fire has started. So what prevented the fire from affecting the, the compartment of the plane where SRAM A nuclear weapons were is a strong wind which kept the flames away from the weapons compartment. Because it turned out that tests on those weapons later in the decade documented that they were very highly sensitive to fire. This outcome was contingent on three variables that were strictly independent from control practices. The continued presence of strong wind, as long as we needed uh, wind for the fire to stop. The fact that it did not change direction in those three hours. And finally, the fact that the burning B-52 was parked in the right location on the tarmac for the wind to have such effects. If the flames had reached the high explosives in the plane, this would at a minimum have spread a plume of toxic plutonium over a wide area. So the point that Roger Basil, the director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab at the time, testified in 1988 and said it would have been worse than Chernobyl. That's one example uh, in which the outcome was independent from control practices. The example I wanna give you of uh, an outcome that took place uh, thanks to the failure of control practices, I'll be briefer about uh, this example because it's uh, better known. It's the se September 26, 1983, uh, the case where a uh, radar officer uh, Petrov uh, essentially detected five incoming missiles on his radar screen and decided to report this as not an attack. Uh, and it was later revealed there was a technological failure. We can go into more detail about what the failure was. But the point is, uh, Colonel Petrov was not trained to take so long to report the incident. And as a matter of fact, he was blamed for not adequately uh, writing everything up as things were going along in his notebook. And essentially, um, his career ended after that. So it's essentially his failure to do what was expected of him and his ability to trust his gut feeling that 
uh, contributed to preventing uh, a nuclear explosion. Those are only two cases. Essentially, what, what needs to be said at the out front from, um, on, on the Cuban Missile Crisis is essentially that uh, the luck argument became prominent uh, in the general public, mostly after the Earl Morris uh, documentary in 2003, The Fog of War, in which then Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert McNamara, used the word luck and said, uh, it in, well, what he exactly says is, in the end, we lucked out. It was a luck that prevented nuclear war. And from then on, uh, essentially, uh, there should have been an attempt to take that seriously. So what, what, what I'm doing now is building on the uh, great early works of Chick Perot and Scott Sagan uh, and Eric Schlosser on, on safety and articulate essentially what this role of luck uh, means. But what it means is essentially that the right decision was made out of limited of force information, that uh, the safety of the weapons was massively lower than expected. And most importantly, the limits of the leader's control over the weapons let me give you two maybe specific examples. Um, one example is just JFK himself. So Sheldon Stern and a lot of the scholarship has established that the memories of the members of the XCOM have been self-serving. XCOM, by the way, was the advisory group that President Kennedy had gathered to advise him at the time of the crisis during those fateful 13 days, most of the XCOM members uh, have changed their mind. And at every point in time during those 13 days, there was a majority in favor of the use of force uh, in Cuba. And so what we know is that if Cuba had been bombed or invaded, escalation was extremely likely. The conclusion of all of this is that Kennedy's resolve not to let the majority in favor of use of force win the conversation was crucial. Why am I insisting on that? I'm insisting on that because Kennedy's decisive role is evidence of luck in an unusual way. Uh, and that requires a detour by uh, Kennedy's health. So Kennedy's health required him to essentially receive a lot of pain-killing medicine, mostly for back pain, but for a series of other uh, problems, to the point that he had appointed two independent teams of doctors to make sure that each team would not know what the other team would give him, so that he could always request, if needed, more of those painkillers. What we've discovered later is that those painkillers included steroids, which were, uh, I mean, had the potential to seriously cloud his judgment. And here I rely on the work of Rose McDermott mostly. Um, to the point that one of the doctors called Max Jacobson or Dr. Feelgood then lost the authorization to practice medicine for essentially uh, treating his patients with a, a, a dose that would have been suitable only for horses. So what I'm saying here is we have a president whose role was decisive and whose judgment was contingent on the substances that were administered to him and were essentially beyond his control. We are just lucky that Dr. Feelgood did not act around the president at the time of the crisis. That's one case of luck. Another case of luck is that there is an ICBM test launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, which was not canceled on August 26, 1962, even though essentially order to not launch this missile had been given. That's another case in which 
the outcome um, was favorable uh, in spite of a failure either in the command and control or in the implementation of orders. Uh, the third example that I will give you in terms of the limits of leaders' control over the weapons is that on October 27, 1962, at the peak of the crisis, a U-2 plane was shot down over Cuba. And that happened without General Pleyev, who was in charge of um, Soviet forces in Cuba, or without Khrushchev's approval. So those are, those are modes of luck in the Cuban Missile Crisis. The most famous story, which I, I um, coming to last because this is already well known, is the fact that three decades later and only three decades later, Will McNamara discover that the Soviet submarines around Cuba were uh, carrying a nuclear tipped torpedo. Um, and one of those submarines got really close to uh, launching the torpedo because the submarine had been hit by practice depth charges uh, and essentially lost control with Moscow. The protocol being if you lose control with Moscow, it may be that nuclear war has already started. And in that case, uh, you're allowed to cause as much damage to the enemy as necessary. And there again, uh, the fate of nuclear escalation relied not in the instruction from the state leader, but in the hands of, in that case, uh, an officer whose name is Vasily Arkhipov. If anyone in your audience is interested in looking into this scholarship or in doing their own studies of how can we possibly you know, study luck, of course you need a definition, which is I, what I modestly try to do. But the, the second question is, what are the cases we've looked at that? But the third is, why have we been so blind to it? And so here, I really think that that connects to work I've been doing on, on uh, scholarly responsibility and modes of self-censorship. Essentially, in a 2016 piece in the Journal of Global Security Studies, I'm showing that the normative, the rhetorical, in the uh, imaginal boundaries of the field of nuclear studies, essentially create an implicit responsibility of nuclear scholars. So the field is structured so that scholarship is being written as though we were only responsible vis-a-vis -vis the managers of the nuclear present, a present which is expected to be extended into the future. And so given that understanding of our own responsibility and the requirement of policy relevance, the sense is, oh, we need to help nuclear crisis managers manage crises better. And so essentially talking about luck is treated as a disciplinary defeat because you may have to tell them that in some instances, either they will not be able to manage the crises or you will not be able to tell them in advance what is manageable and what isn't. So there, uh, the problem is a narrow notion of scholarly responsibility and of policy relevance. The other, uh, and uh, essentially the distortion there is what I call a practical inconsistency because it's when the papers come to the policy recommendations that essentially when they've engaged with luck before they drop the luck issue or they, do, they write as though it doesn't matter. Then there is an epistemic inconsistency where there is acknowledgement of luck, but then luck is turned into quantifiable and predictable risk, which is a completely different beast. Those would be the main two reasons in uh, scholarship. But I would say that, you know, uh, we like to think of ourselves as primarily scholars, but what we're looking at is also psychological, institutional, and anthropological reasons for blindness to luck. So we're also uh, human beings, and those blinders also apply to us. One uh, explicit, uh, institutional blinder is just that those who are best qualified 
to face cases of neonuclear use or nuclear accidents. They have an institutional requirement to essentially cover them because the mandate of nuclear safety organizations is an unusual one in terms of one nuclear explosion, one failure that would lead to a nuclear explosion is radically intolerable. So we see uh, mostly in the accounts of, of safety engineers, uh, Robert Purifoy, how uh, he tried to brief the upper management at Sandia about the Goldsboro accident and the Grand Forks accident that I previously described to you. And essentially the upper management uh, in several interviews told me the same story. The upper management reacted in saying, oh, if we're facing problems of that kind, imagine how much worse the Soviets must have it. And I'm like, yes, maybe, maybe not. But even if that's the case, that doesn't solve your problem. So there, that's an institutional inability to acknowledge the limits of your control over the weapons because the institutions themselves essentially have to maintain a mandate of perfect control. Um, then there is, even within the institution at the personal level, a reluctance to report accidents and limits of control. And here I'm gonna give you something I found in the French literature. Um, in the memoirs of Admiral Philippon, who was a, a personal chief of staff of General de Gaulle, and in his uh, memoir, which is called La Royale et le Roi, which apparently no one has read, he documents that he always would report every single thing to de Gaulle. And then there is this amazing sentence in which he says, oh, there's actually just one incident that I didn't report, just one. And then he adds, but that would probably have been the most serious one. And he explains, this is the one instance in the early 1960s in which a Mirage 4 plane took off uh, out of an unauthorized uh, protocol, I can tell you more about, uh, with uh, nuclear weapons under its wing. And, you know, you can tell me, oh yeah, but that doesn't matter because the plane, you know, just would turn around and come back. Yeah, except for the fact that uh, they've never been trained to land with the bomb under their wings. That wasn't the plan. So th there you have an instance of someone whose job is to report uh, limits of safety and limits of control. And he realizes that this is such bad news that you'd rather not report. This is essentially a career incentive that you can find, I mean, that we found in archives in the US and in France. So those are, those are essentially institutional uh, dimensions. Then there is a dimension which is simply uh, you know, it's well known in content of psychology. It's, it's a retrospective illusion of control and understanding. It's the assumption that uh, what we know about something and what we believe is its level of validity that they match, that we are aware of the level of validity of what we know, uh, and that in retrospect, we tell stories in terms of, of control. The third the third type of blinders uh, of blinder is essentially, I would say, emotional, and that's something that we are starting to do research on. Um, the team and I have done surveys on uh, the public of nuclear weapon states in Europe, as well as uh, citizens of countries which host U.S. nuclear weapons. And what we've discovered is that they express in very large parts or a very large number of them expresses uh, feelings of depression, fear, and worry when they think about the possibility of nuclear disasters. And if that's true, it's kind of intuitive to understand how this leads to an incentive to just fall back into trusting the reassuring voices trusting back the discourse of perfect control. It certainly doesn't have a direct implications on what should be done in the future, 
because that would deny the fact that you know the future can be surprising and that choices about the future will have adverse effects and include value judgments. But what it does is that it changes the way we articulate the bets we make. So essentially, what it tells you is a bet on having nuclear weapons around for another 50 to 70 years and not having nuclear explosions is not just betting on perfect control again as we did before. No, it's actually betting on being as lucky in the future as we have been in the past, which is a completely different you know, kind of wager. And it also underlines, as, as you just suggested, that this is based on painstaking research by what, like 10 scholars in the world to uncover cases of close calls and cover-ups in what we, so, we should also not be massively optimistic and assume that, you know, essentially history comes to uh, tell us the truth as time passes. Because that's, I mean, as we know from the US, but also from the French case, there are cases of reclassification. So the situation uh, that we're in is that we have a reasonably good record of past cases of neonuclear use in the US. And in the UK, it's, no, it's nowhere near satisfactory in any other nuclear weapon state. And as a result of that, it's a very, very unrisky bet to say that in all of this, we will uncover other cases of that. Um, also, just yeah, in terms of what it means for IR, those of us who think about the long piece, the long piece assumes that continued practice of nuclear threats produced peace, right? And the, essentially the long piece is claimed to be exceptional because it's claimed to be continued. What the luck argument does is it injects discontinuities in the so-called long piece. So essentially for us scholars, and that's something I'm, I'm trying to do, but I, I'd welcome any suggestions or help on how to do that. It allows us to reset the claim of, okay, how much longer do we need to live without a nuclear war so that we can actually say the duration is exceptional? Because so far, it ha the duration that we've been in so far is not exceptional. Just you know, a few a few uh, implications, but really the luck argument has implications for security, for the way you think about ethics, it, and also in terms of political implications. Uh, in terms of you know, for example, if you talk about democratic accountability, then the issue is how do you communicate the limit of your ability to say. I can no longer protect you, or there are limits to how much I control those weapons. The framework that would propose that allows to account for luck, close calls, uh, blindness to it, is really to rethink about, to rethink our bets on nuclear futures in terms of vulnerabilities, both material, epistemic, and political. And this is doable with the tools and the methodologies of, of IR and political science. The key message, we don't have to treat luck as unaccountable, and it would be faulty to act as though it doesn't matter. We just need to just, you know, struggle with it and find a way to account for it. And the claim I'm putting to you is that we can.